Welcome to Words of Grace, radio ministry of Elder Ben Winslet, pastor of the Flint River Primitive Baptist Church near Huntsville, Alabama. We invite you to stay tuned to today's broadcast. Recently, our theme on Words of Grace has been that of suffering. Today, I want to share with you a part of the message that I delivered last weekend at Flint River Primitive Baptist Church entitled, There's a Lion on the Loose. This message comes from the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 11. The theme of this message is our enemy, that wicked one that desires our undoing. He desires to harm us, and not only does he afflict us to overthrow our faith, as we considered last week, but he wants to deceive us through subtle craftiness and deception to beguile us, to trick us, to deceive us, and to corrupt us. Here is today's message, There is a Lion on the Loose. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. This is a forewarning that Paul is about to begin touting some of his experiences, as it were, contrasting his labors with those who trouble the church. You know his track record. He was with you for 18 months. All the Christians know him. This is the apostle to the Gentiles. This is a Gentile church. This was the man that God sent to constitute all of these Gentile churches and ordained men who would go carrying on that work. This is the person they need to be listening to. Verse 2, I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. To be clear, jealousy as a general rule is not a good thing. Sometimes you have jealousy among the ministry. That's not a good thing. Sometimes in a region you have jealousy between churches. That's not a good thing. When someone repents, what happens with the angels in heaven in the gospel? They rejoice. If somebody joins a church 10 miles away, I don't need to look at them like someone just swapped my pulpit water with vinegar. When someone experiences a blessing, maybe in the church across town, what I'm to do is rejoice. When the church across town might be going through trouble, you know what I'm to do? I'm to lament it and pray for them and do anything I can to help them. Because that's what God has called us to do. Sometimes jealousy exists in the house of God and it's not a good thing. Sometimes factions in churches fight for the power in church, and that's not a good thing either. Jealousy is not a good thing. But this is a case in which the Bible uses it in a positive sense. I'm jealous over you, church. I'm jealous over you, church. With a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul is jealous of this church. Because the false teachers have led them into error and led them into sin, and it offends him, and the emotion that he experienced about this was jealousy. I'm jealous over this church. I'm upset that these people have led you astray. My heart burns for you guys, and I desire not the popularity, not the benefit of it, He is jealous because he has espoused them, in a sense, to Christ, and he wants to present them as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, that's a metaphor for simply saying, I want this church to be without corruption. I want it to be without corruption, and I want to lift it up to Jesus and say, Christ, Lord, Savior, Master, this is the church at Corinth. This is the work This is what we've done here. I lift it up to you. I present it unto you. And he's jealous over that. If I were to ever leave here, and then I learned that there was terrible trouble after I left, and people that maybe we had baptized left the faith, or someone came in and they just tore it all to pieces, you know how bad that would hurt? Oh, what a sad thing that is for a minister of the gospel to experience. That's exactly what Paul went through. That's painful. It's a terrible thing. That's an awful thing. And he says, I'm jealous because I want to present you without corruption. Now, here's our statement for today. 
But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. As Satan beguiled Eve, so your minds, I fear, should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Corruption versus chastity is the contrast here. We'll come back to it. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which ye have not received, John would say to try the spirits, because many false prophets have entered into the world. If you receive a spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. What is another Jesus? The earliest attacks in Christianity against the faith were from people who taught a different version of Jesus than the actual version of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does it mean to preach another Jesus? In John's day, and even in Paul's day, as you see in the book of Colossians, which was our study of about a year ago, there were what you could call proto-Gnostics who denied the humanity and the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the time John dies and, and he writes 1 John, his first epistle, by the time he's an old man and he's writing 1 John, Gnosticism is developing. Now, there was an evil man in the book of Acts chapter 8 who hung around with the Christians for a while named Simon the Sorcerer. And it's believed that Simon the Sorcerer, historically referred to as Simon Magus, was the originator of Gnosticism. The Gnostics taught that Christ was some sort of a lesser deity that through enlightenment, through him, you could transcend leaving the physical realm to the higher, greater, ultimate deity. That's heresy. And not only did the Gnostics deny his deity and his divinity, but they denied his humanity. They deny his deity. They say he's not God. They deny his humanity in that they say he has no physical form. This would be a plague upon the first and early second century church. You ever heard of Gnostic Gospels? You ever heard that word? Like the Gospel of Thomas and all of these other books, they're not authentically biblical. Some of these wicked perversions actually have Judas as the hero. That's as bad as you can get. What would be another Jesus other than the Gnostic version of Jesus? Arianism, which denied his deity, denied the divinity of Christ, and taught that he was a man who ascended into being what he was as the Son of God, and that is heresy. So who is the real Jesus? He is God incarnate. He's the God-man. He is the Word that was made flesh that dwelt among us, we beheld His glory, all things were made by Him in the beginning, and without Him was not anything made that was made. John chapter 1, Jesus is God. But these false apostles, did you realize it was that serious? They preached another Jesus. Christology is an issue that I get upset in a hurry over. Because if we have not the right Christology, we have nothing. We have no foundation. That's the foundation in 1 Corinthians 3. If that's wrong, we built our house on the wrong rock. We've got to have that right. What's another thing that he says here? He says another spirit. John says try the spirits. Or another gospel. What is another gospel? Let me define the gospel for you real simply. The gospel is the good news, because that's what gospel means. Doesn't mean bad news, doesn't mean scary news, doesn't mean offer or proposition, it means good news. When the good news that World War II was over reached our shore, that was not a proposition, was it? It was a declaration of good news. Gospel means good news. The gospel is the good news of salvation by grace through the finished work of Jesus Christ. If it's not that, guess what it's not? It ain't the gospel.
The gospel is salvation by grace. What is grace? Unmerited favor. You don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. There are people here that probably thought they were earning it. Through whatever means, works, pietism. Look at what they did with the Galatians. Look what happened in Acts chapter 15. You have people who come down to Antioch from Jerusalem and they say, Oh, you Gentiles, you really have to be circumcised to be saved. And Paul's like, that's not right. That's not right at all. And so there's a huge debate over that. And all of these people go back to Jerusalem. Paul and his yoke fellows, his entourage, and these false teachers, they go to Jerusalem and they hash it out with the apostles and the elders. But by the time it's in Jerusalem, you know what they're saying? You've got to be circumcised and there's always an and. And you've got to keep all the law of Moses. They just Judaized Gentile Christianity. Righteousness through the works of the law. If there were a law that could be given so that righteousness would have come by the law, then righteousness would have come by the law, and that law would have been given. But guess what? You know what Peter says about that in Acts 15? It is a yoke of bondage which neither we nor our fathers were able to bear. Salvation by works is a yoke of bondage. If it's not grace... It's not gospel. Paul would say in Romans chapter 11 that if you add works to grace, guess what it does to the grace? It ceases to be grace and becomes work. You say, but it's only one work. Exactly, that work. If it be of grace, it is no more work, lest grace is no more grace. And if it be of works, it's no more of grace, lest work is no more work. You see, words have meanings. Grace means unmerited, work means merit, and salvation is by what? By Paul emphatically declared over and over and over and over again. It's by works? No. It's by grace. Saved by grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Salvation is by grace, and that is the gospel. We have to get that right. From here, Paul begins referring to himself. Verse 5, he says, I wasn't behind in ability of any of the apostles. Verse 6 says, you guys may call me rude in speech. Remember that last message from three weeks ago? He says, you know, I might be rude in speech, but I'm not in knowledge. I'm not in knowledge. I think I know a few things as an apostle, he would say in verse 7. He continues to speak about himself and the fact that he was abased talks about the fact that he robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do this church at Corinth service. Speaks about how other churches sent to his relief because the church at Corinth didn't do their duty to him. And he would confront very hostily the false apostles in verses 12, 13, and 14. In verses 21 through 33, he shares his struggles all the suffering that he experienced as a minister. Ministers like to grumble, but he's not whining. And any time I'm inclined to whine, you know what I'll do? Go read this passage that Paul shared of his sufferings, because then I'm like, you know, really have it pretty good. But let's look at a couple of passages, a little bit of a meat of this text, as it were. Verse 3. I fear, lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now let's look at verses 13 and 14. Regarding these false apostles, they are deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, listen to this, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of what? An angel of light. An angel of light. And so don't be surprised if his ministers, did you know Satan has ministers? He has people on the payroll. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Please understand Now we're not lordship salvationists that go around damning everybody to hell. But at the same time, there are people who are outright evil, wicked people who come into church, become preachers, 
to prey on you. And you need to know that. These people that work for Satan, he says their end shall be according to their works. That means they're goats. In fact, what Jesus would call them in the book of Matthew is ravenous wolves who go about in sheep's clothing seeking to prey on the little defenseless sheep of Christ. Did you know you're a little defenseless sheep of Christ? Say, no, I'm not. I'm a sheep dog. Keep telling yourself that. We're sheep. We're sheep. Sheep are vulnerable. Sheep are gullible. What does the wolf want to do? He wants to eat the sheep. He wants to devour the sheep. He wants to destroy the sheep. And so Satan sends these men into the church to infiltrate the church that he might lead certain sheep astray and devour them. That's a word that's going to come into the message in just a moment. Satan has sent men into Corinth. Verse 3. From these two passages, we have Satan beguiling through what? Obvious billboards and banners? Marketing campaigns. Blinking lights. How does Satan deceive? Subtlety. Number two, Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. That's deception. That's impersonation. If he can impersonate that which is good, those who do his bidding can also appear to be good and have something good to offer you. They can appear to have something good. Listen to me. They can appear to have something good to offer you. They're selling something. Something destructive. And it might not even be that all the ingredients of that which they're peddling is bad. Arianism taught someone named Jesus. Gnosticism taught someone named Jesus. The Gnostics taught the concept of election. They take a little truth, and then they take a little error, and they mix it together, and it sounds a lot like the way they produce rat poison, doesn't it? You take a little bit of food... Because if you just set arsenic down on the table, the rat's going to go, I don't, I don't want to eat the arsenic. But if you mix it in with something he wants to eat, suddenly that rat comes and he eats and he ingests it. He dies because it was tainted. It was poisoned. They appear to offer you something that is good. Satan does the bait and switch. And he sells you tainted things. He, he wants to tell you that this is good. This is going to be a benefit to you. But when you get it, what it's going to do is it's going to destroy you. Satan beguiles through subtlety. The word beguile means quite simply to trick. And we know what it means. There's no deeper meaning in the original language that I could share with you about the word beguile. Simply means to what? To trick you. To beguile you means to deceive you or to trick you. The word subtle here is a little different, though, than we understand it in today's time. Every other place this word translates in the New Testament, it translates into the word craftiness. And if you look at the way this word was used in archaic English, guess what the word meant? Rather than subtle, as in very faint, subtle hints, subtlety in the KJV doesn't necessarily have reference just to being very faint with what you're presented with. But it has more reference to craftiness, sneaking around and tricking you into doing something. It came to mean more of a gentle or delicate, rather, sort of influence. So if Satan beguiles through craftiness... That means that he was intentional, All right? Now, I want to go back and look in just a moment at Genesis chapter 3. Craftiness means that Satan, in 
trying to lead you astray is not haphazard. How many of you go through your weeks at times a little haphazard? Satan's not haphazard. He's crafty. He's intentional. He plots. He plans. He executes his destructive goals on humanity. And where we see this, the strongest, the greatest example of this is the one that Paul uses. What's the example of Satan's subtle craftiness that he uses in this passage? The beguiling of Eve in the beginning of time. Now, by the way, the New Testament does not assume that the Old Testament is a fable, a metaphor, an allegory, a moral lesson, or something to be spiritualized. The New Testament assumes the Old Testament is literal historic fact. Jesus references Noah, Jesus references Jonah, Jesus references Moses, Jesus references creation. He references Adam and Eve. At no point did he use those as moral lessons without historical fact as the basis. Lest by any means, Paul says, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Satan deceives Eve, and what happens to the human race? Well, what did Jesus call Satan in the beginning of, or in his ministry regarding Satan in the beginning of time? A liar. And what was the other one? Do you remember? A murderer. Those are not randomly selected titles. He lied to Eve, and in lying to Eve, he does what to the human race? He murders them. What happened because Adam sinned? Death. death. Who brought death upon the human race? Well, Adam did. By one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. But why did Adam sin? Because of the deception of Satan on his wife. Genesis 3. Verse 1, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of the tree, of every tree in the garden. He knows what God says, first of all. He knows what God says. He knows this. Did God tell you not to do anything in specific? You notice he doesn't just come right out with it. Remember, craftiness. There's a plan, a plot, an execution. The woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. The serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, Then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God, knowing good and evil. What does Satan do to beguile Eve here? He questions God's word. Hath God said? I think you misunderstood him. I don't really think that's what he meant. No, he knows. He knows that if you eat it, you're just going to be like a God, be as God's, having your eyes opened. You see what he's promising them? He challenges what God says. He questions what God says. And then he promises elevation in their situation. He promises them an exaltation, an upgrade, an evolution, if you will, if you just violate the one thing God told you to do. It's going to be good. You're going to enjoy it. You're going to be like God Himself if you just do what God told you not to do. You see how He does the bait and switch and He lies and He's a murderer. The woman, when she saw that the tree was good for food, well, it looks good, that it was pleasant to the eyes. It's a really good-looking tree. It's got fruit on it that smells good. A tree desired to make one wise. I hear there's some health benefit to it. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, 
and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves apron. And this was the fall of mankind into sin. How does Satan beguile you? Well, you just read it. Questions what God says. He gives an ulterior spin on what will happen. He sells you this bill of goods, as it were, and in doing that, he slays you. If you think for a moment that Satan's agenda for you today is any different than he had for Eve and Adam in the beginning of time, then you've got another thing coming. He wants the exact same thing for you today. Second, Satan transforms himself into what? An angel of light. He impersonates even an angel of light. He's our adversary. He's our accuser. He's a liar. He's a murderer. And he will go to the lengths of making himself masquerading even as an angel of light, as you read in verse 14. No marvel Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Three takeaways. Number one, the wicked one's agenda is your destruction, period. This is not ultimately just to hurt you, but to attack your faith. His agenda is your destruction. Number two, Satan will lie to you. He will misrepresent God to you to accomplish this destruction. Number three, his ways are far too conniving to be as obvious as we think that they are. He doesn't appear as a giant red creature with horns and a tail and a pitchfork. He's the social media influencer that you think, I wish I was like them. He's the person that tries through peer pressure to get you to do drugs or to use language that you shouldn't use. Or to look at things that you shouldn't look at, all the while promising that it's going to make you really happy and fulfill your life. He looks splendid and appealing to us. His plots don't involve flashing billboards, but deceptive schemes to lead you astray, to destroy you. And so as we close today, I want to read 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober. What do we need to do? Be sober, minded, clear thinking, and vigilant. That means to stay awake and be alert. Open your eyes, think clearly, stay awake, be alert. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring Lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith. Praise God, it's not our job to defeat Satan, because you and I couldn't. You know who defeated Satan? The Lord Jesus Christ. What's your job? To resist him, and he will flee from you. Whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren, that are in all the world. Be where because there is a lion on the loose. If you enjoy the messages you hear on Words of Grace, consider this your invitation to visit a Primitive Baptist Church in your community. Copies of this and other broadcasts are available for download on iTunes and on our website. Address your correspondence to Words of Grace Radio, 641 Moontown Road, Brownsboro, Alabama, 35741. Or visit us online at flintriverpbc.org.